Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, what you know about benchmark? Uh-huh. They're speaking the facts that you wanna hear. They rep a jersey, the vision is clear. Diamonds glisten like a chandelier. You know what I'm here for, like Michelle Lynch. It clutch time, we do not flinch. Real brothers, we do not switch. Hit home runs with the right pitch. Who run the city? Ooh. What to do when they hating on you? I feel like Kobe 2010. Taking an L, all I need is a win. This is his business, you know how they go. They playing the seats, now it's time to grow. Tune in now, gotta be in the know. Showtime, bitch, my butter blow. We Woo. know. Welcome back to another episode of the Bitch Mob Podcast. Finally starting tonight. It's a late, late one tonight. Thank you to all of the followers, our listeners, everybody that tunes into Bench Mob. We appreciate y'all big time. I'm joined by the whole crew tonight. We got Chris, Moneybag, CJ Bill is in the building. How you doing? Here we tonight? go. Here we go with that blast me. But I'm um, good, man. Back, back again, ready, ready to get at it. Hey, shout out our man Filet, man. I know he's doing his thing. Shout out Filet. Shout out to Jesse. Uh, we definitely have with me tonight my man Miles, left-handed smooth operator. I do it for the ladies. Davenport is in the building. How you feeling tonight, my boy? Doing good, yo. Free, free Bobby Schmurder. He's out. So Bobby Schmurter is out. <laughs> hey, I was it's wondering too. So I'm when is they gonna let Bobby out? You got this joker is six nine out here doing the craziest stuff, and you got the real ones in jail. Shout out to Bobby Schmurter being out. You know him and Rowdy gonna go crazy. I can't wait for them to drop some music. And of course, we are joined by Mr. Hot Takes himself, Greg G. Baby Sins Man. I don't care what the fans say. How you doing tonight? I'm good, bro. I'm good. Different setting tonight. I'm feeling good. You know, Nets went five and on the road. So, you know, I'm feeling great. I'm feeling great, man. That's funny enough. I was literally going to start off the show and let you have the floor to talk about your Nets going on a five-day winning streak because you have said to us that we only talk about the Nets when they lose. So the floor is yours. How do you feel about your five-game winning streak? And for those games, KD didn't even play. He just was on the bench making faces. (laughs) <laughs> you know, it's, it's scary hours bro that's what james said right it's scary hours like it, they, they're figuring it out and they're figuring it out how to play they're figuring out how to play team defense too that's the cool thing about the the whole road trip and how it came together for them they're playing team defense they're storming to the basketball they're playing small they don't even start deandre jordan anymore they have bruce brown in the game playing like a pseudo five and it's working they play they're really fast they get in transition they force turnovers they jump passing lanes and then on offense like Yo, I'm, I haven't seen anything like this before. Like, it, it's actually crazy because they can go from pacing space, hitting threes at the Warriors to, like, completely changing their style and having two guys on the floor. And when Katie's there, three. But over the road trip, they only had, you know, like you mentioned, they only had um, Kyrie and they had um, and, and Harden. So those two can go ISO and just get buckets whenever they want, too. It, it's, it's crazy. And, and the way – shout out to James Harden, bro. James Harden has completely changed his play style to be, like, just, he's just dominating the game from the sense where he just controls the pace of the game. He's in complete control because he, he's able to pass guys open. I told people about OKC James Harden. This is OKC James Harden with new tricks, man. He's fitting into the system, and he, he gets he gets whatever he look, wants. He can get a catch and shoot. He can get it out of the pick and roll. He can get it out of straight ISO. He's unguardable. Like, it's actually crazy. When you have those three on the same team, and you got Kyrie playing at the level he's playing at where he's getting, what, he's 50, 40, 90. He was he was he was 50, 50, 90 at some point this year. Um, it's, it's starting to t- taper off a little bit, but you got these guys playing at that level; they're going to be hard to beat. So I I, <laughs> I hope for the rest of the league's sake, these guys don't get Andre Drummond because if they do, it's something and stuck. Well, that's what Cardi said, right? It's something and stuck. It's, it's yep. going to be something. <laughs> hey, I was just about to ask with how they playing. Do you want an Andre Drummond still? Yeah, for sure. I mean. DeAndre is playing well because DeAndre is more in a natural role where he's coming off the bench. So he's bringing that energy. It's not the, I don't need you starting. He's just doing his job. Like last night against the Clippers, his energy was incredible. He had the big tip in. 
he had four blocks, I think, in that game. And that was the first time I'd seen him have that many blocks since the Clippers days. Like, he hadn't had a game that dominant in a while. Or maybe that first year, but maybe the first year in Brooklyn, he had a game like that earlier on. But he looked good, man. He looks, he looks, he's playing with more energy. And I, I said it, I said it on the show numerous times. Like he just doesn't bring that energy every single night. It's not consistent. So when he brings it, that team, it, it, it makes it really hard to beat. Like they just really are there. And and so if he can bring that, that's great. But you still want to have a guy to spell him. You still want to be able to go big, especially when AD gets back. Because when AD gets back, it's going to be a problem for anyone that's trying to guard him in the post. It will not be easy. Uh, the Nets are going to try to go to a lot of gimmicks, and it won't necessarily work. So you, you, you want a big body like Drummond to help out. And not that he can guard him either, because he can't. But just just to kind of slow him down, like in B2. True, true, true. So on the whole other spectrum, I guess you can say, the Celtics, huge loss last night. We were talking about it. We didn't foresee a comeback happening. They are 4-6 and six over the last 10 games. They're 7-10. and 10. In away games, Marky Smart is still out. What's your takeaways on how the Celtics have been playing? We were all, I think it's safe to say, considering them to be a top four team, maybe a contender in the East, a threat at least. Right now, they're not looking like that. What's your takes on the Celtics so far, how they've been playing as of late? Yeah, I mean, I know in like years past, right, we, we talk about the Celtics and, and how they've been a threat, especially in recent years with, with Jason Tatum and, and Jalen Brown, but I, I think this is the worst we, we've seen the Celtics in a while. Obviously, um, Smart has a big part in that and in, in being out since, you know, the end of January with, with his injury. But at the same time, like, you still got Jalen Brown and you still got Jason Tatum playing together at the same time on the same court. And, and they're doing their part, right? And even, like, I, I read an article today, even when they have off nights, like, they're still playing – at a high, high level, they're still producing at a high clip. The problem with the Celtics is they have no bench. It's the role players. When Gordon Hayward left last year, even coming off that gruesome injury, like it still left a, a huge void. And they didn't really, you know, fill that position in the off season. They, they brought another big man in and, and Tristan Thompson. Um, they, they play big. And I think they, they need that third dominant player that, that can, someone that can either come off the bench and give you buckets and, and help you out. But at the same time, like they're, they're struggling right now and, and they got to figure it out. Like this is a long season. When you think about it, they've only played 30 games so far and they're at 500 right now. Like if, if they don't get it figured out now, it's going to be hard for them to try to figure out on the back end. Miles, is Marcus Smart the answer to all their problems? Uh, Not all of them, but he's a huge part. He's like the Draymond Green of this team. He's, the glue that brings this whole team together. He's their best defender. He's selfish. He doesn't need too many shots. He's one of the better three-point shooters on this team. So they really do miss him. I mean, he guards the best shooting guard, point guard on the opposite team of every team they play against. So when I look at this team, it's they've had injuries. Tatum was out for a couple weeks, then – Dylan Brown got hurt for a little bit. So it's like they've been running out different lineups almost every week trying to keep things together. And I've noticed that when they win one game, they, they usually lose the next game. They don't have any winning streaks that consist of anything this year. Like it's – they're a 500 team right now. And we'll see. They said Marcus Smart originally was supposed to be out two to three weeks. Now it's – after the all-star break. So they're going to just have to figure things out. I mean, Kemba, he's been very inconsistent for them. I don't know. He's, they paid him all this money to be that dude. That third option. Yeah. And he's been a shell of himself. This doesn't even look like the same Kemba we saw in Charlotte. So they got to get it together. They got time. Maybe they just need that all-star break, even though it's shorter this year to gather themselves and and see if they can make a big trade, make a, make a splash, maybe bring in Drummond, see if something can can spark them. But right now it's they're not looking like a team that can really compete. They're looking like a team that will they might get knocked out in the first round if they, they keep going at this pace. Greg, what's your takes? What needs to be done for the Celtics? Speaking of Kimba, five for twenty one. One for 12 from three, 14 points. The bench didn't do much. Nesmith had 10. 
Robert Williams, who looked good, but eight points, 13 rebounds. I don't think that's where the answers are going to come. I don't think they have a problem regarding their bigs. Pritchard had a pretty decent game, four points, three assists, nothing to go crazy about. What is it that the Celtics need? Like, is Hayward really – was that really that big of a hole than what people thought? No, it's not about any of that. Um, the, the Celtics are going to be fine. They'll figure it out. They'll make the playoffs. They'll get balanced in the second round like they have for the last three or four years. That's what the Celtics have done. That's what, they, that's what they've become. Um, what this boils down to is Danny Ainge – didn't pull the trigger when he had the chance. He didn't capitalize when the iron was hot, right? I'm, I'm going to stop saying all these cliches, but you guys get the point. Like, he never made the big trade for a superstar. And if you guys, I mean, anybody who listens to the podcast realizes that in the NBA, star power wins. Like, it's an arms race to get the most stars. That's, that's how you win championships in the NBA. It's not about accumulating young talent. Accumulating young talent is great, but it takes longer for that stuff to come, to, to come together. And so, as great as Jason Tatum is, and they hit the lottery there, and as great as Jalen Brown has been, that he's been really good. Um, if they're going to stay on this trajectory, they're a couple of years. They're still a couple of years away from really making any real noise, or, because you're 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 really on Jace, You're really on Jalen Brown's time frame here. Like you're waiting for him to be and J, and Jason Tatum. You're waiting for them to become bona fide superstars, which is going to take time. So they had a chance to. They had so many assets from that Brooklyn Nets trade. They never got the superstar player. It never happened. They got they got Kyrie. And thought, oh, we're set. We're going to win a championship. It didn't work out. Um, so they, they they just missed too many times. Danny Ainge, Danny Ainge failed Boston. That's the reality of it. So, you know, here we are, and we can talk about them. And, you know, they're a good basketball team. But I don't think anybody in Boston had that in mind when this team came together. They had championships in mind. They had they thought they were back to being a dominant team in the NBA. And it hasn't worked out that way. But they'll figure it out. I mean, in terms of the short term, again, they're going to get the second round of the playoffs and get bounced. I don't know by who. Maybe a Philly. Maybe a Milwaukee. They'll, they'll, they'll bounce them out of there. Um, I know Brooklyn will bounce them out of there. We ain't got to talk about that. But, like, they, they, any one of those teams will knock them out. So, um, they're just not good enough. And, and it's not – it's Marcus Smart can come back and he'll help them. But if we talked about Marcus Smart and the role he plays for them. Yes, he's their glue. But over the last couple of years, he's been empowered to take more shots. And I don't know that it's the best thing for the team. Like, I don't like how many shots he takes. He takes some bad shots. Like, like Marcus Smart is, is taking a lot of threes. He's become a volume three-point shooter in certain situations, in certain games. You'll watch him play. It's like, yo, like he, he, takes, he takes shots like he's a sharpshooter. And it hurts that team. It does. So, it, Marcus Smart is like, it's torn it down, play great defense, and really set just set things up for, for Jalen. You want to get the ball in Jason Tatum's hand as much as possible and Jalen Brown's hands as much as possible. That's the way you're going to win games. And get Kemba going, because Kemba's a shell of himself. I know he's getting healthy now. I know he's got some bounce back in his step. And we know how good of a point guard he is. But, yo, shout out to our man Dion. He said it, he said it best with, with him. He was in, in Charlotte playing losing basketball for years. This is his first taste of winning basketball. Everything changes when you play winning basketball. It's a lot harder to play in winning situations. I keep, I keep saying this. It is so much more difficult to play on a good team than it is to play on a bad team. It changes everything. The good shots you thought were good when you were playing for a bad team are suddenly terrible shots on a good team. That's just the way it is. So that's why I always give players who are on winning teams more credit than players who are on bad teams. Um, but, yeah, man, I mean, Kemba's still getting acclimated too. So, yeah, they're way away. They're, they're not making any real noise this year. It, it's cute. Like, I think the Celtics are, are exactly where we don't want to be in the NBA. They're like, they're like middle of the pack. And, and that's the worst place to be in the NBA. Either be really horrible – because you might run into, you know, Cade Cunningham, like a superstar generational player, or be great. But being in the middle is just like, like the Pacers, unacceptable. Boston, as a historic franchise that they are, they are failing by all means in that regard. Um, championship town, championship organization. So middle of the pack is not where they want to be. They do have a bright future with two all-stars with Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, Kimba Walker was an all-star. All-star teams were released. East all-star starters, Kyrie, Bradley Bill finally got his nod and his respect. KD, Giannis, and Joel and B. Who are y'all putting as y'all reserves for the East team? You go first, Miles. 
How many reserves you got, though? Real quick. You got to have, so I'll run it down for you. It's two guards, three front courts, and two wild cards. So you're going to get two guards, three people in the front court, and two wild cards. So it's five starters already, and you got to come up with another seven. It's a 12-man roster. Miles, Julius Randall up there. Hell yeah. Of course he's up there. That's who I was going to say first. He needs to be – put some respect. He's – He's had a bounce back year. I mean, he should make the team on the simple fact that the Knicks are middle of the pack in the playoff hunt right now. Nobody really thought they'd be here to start the year. People thought we'd only have 13 wins this whole season, and we got 14 at this point. So he's had a great year, a bounce back year. He's gained the respect of the fans back. So let's throw him on there. Uh, who else? Of course, you got to throw Tatum on there. I think it wouldn't be a doubt if he didn't miss those two or three weeks because of COVID. But you can't deny the talent. He's having another good year. Jalen Brown as well. I, I would put both of them, honestly. They're both having all-star worthy years. Uh, I can't leave out Harden, too. He didn't get named a starter, but he's probably – number six on that, that team. Because if he was here at the beginning of the year, the Nets might even have three starters in that in that uh, starting backcourt. Uh, I got to throw Levine in there. That's been my guy for years. Uh, he's having another year. He's just – he keeps getting better, I feel like, every year. Ever since he tore his ACL and came to Chicago, he just keeps getting better. And he hasn't lost a step. Athleticism still there. He's shown he can take over. He's doing it right now. Um, I'll throw Middleton on there just for the fact that he is solid. I don't know if he gets the credit that a lot of people should be giving him because he's a really good two guard in this league and his passing is underrated. He averages like 25 and five. Not many players are doing that. So, and then. I'll throw my boy Fred in there, Fred Van, Van Vliet. He's having Fred a good go. year. Yeah, Freddie, Freddie's having a good year. He's, he's my sleeper, my wild card uh, to make the team, okay. especially with how he's taken the, over the role of Kyle Lowry, who's been out for stretches this year. And he's taken over games. He even had a, a 50 ball last month. So that's – how many is that? Is that six? That's your seven right there. Like that. Seven right there, Al. Chris, who are you putting on for your East Reserves? Yeah, I mean, I got to go with a lot of the same people that, that Miles went with. But one person uh, he didn't mention was, was Ben Simmons. And, and here's why. Ben Ben Simmons, his we talked about him. And, and Greg, I look at Greg's face right now. I know he... <laughs> He got to he gotta improve his shooting and whatnot. But at the same time, Ben Simmons, he's a great two-way player, right? And for, for, for Ben Simmons to have the Philadelphia 76ers in the top spot in the East right now, I know I know we're going to say Joel Embiid is doing that, and he is, but Ben Simmons is also a big part of where they're at right now, leading the East and, and being in that number one spot. Um, Embiid's getting a lot of buckets. He's getting a lot of points. He's being dominant. But at the same time, Without Ben Simmons, I don't think the the Sixers are number one in the East right now. So uh, I'm definitely going to add Ben to that. Levine, he's a beast. He's he's uh, averaging the highest that he has in, in his career with uh, points, rebounds, uh, assists. He's basically exceeding all the expectations that he previously had in the past. And for Julius Randle as well to uh, be irrelevant a few years back right and now come to the Knicks and, and have them in playoff contention for the first time since 2013 like that's huge so you got to have him in there too um of course we, we talked about Chris Middleton we talked about Fred Van Fleet um I, I think uh there's one more name that I wanted to mention earlier that I don't think Miles hit on okay. it'll cut it no nah, it'll, it'll come to me but um let me go ahead and, and pull it up real quick because, Greg, why don't you go I'll go ahead and pull this up because I know you're going to have something to say about this too. 
Greg, exactly. who's on your who's on your reserves? It kind of look like you got to use the bath right now, but who's on your reserves? <laughs> Who me? Yeah, your leg shaking and all that. Oh, <laughs> oh. I'm antsy, man. I'm not in my chair. I'm just antsy, bro. But um, <laughs> but um, <laughs> it, it, if I had you know, so the Ben Simmons, the, the only thing I think about with the Eastern Conference and the reserves is with the three forward spots. Because I don't think I don't consider Chris Middleton be to be a uh, a, a forward on court. So, yeah, you know what I'm saying. So unless he's like the wild card, that's the only thing. So like a guy like Demontis Sabonis probably gets in, and I don't even I don't want to do it, but he's gonna get in. I I don't want to put him in there, but I think he's an I think he'll end up getting into the game because of the, this format of it. But um, I pen, pencil him in. I don't want to pick him, but pencil him in. Uh, then you go. I, my two guards are easy: Levine, easy Harden. Harden would be starting if he'd been here since the beginning of the of the, the season, like Miles said. Um, but I'm glad Bill's getting that start because uh, he's suffering. So he deserves some kind of happiness here. Um, so you've got Harden and you've got a Levine. Um, and and the, the Ben Simmons thing is so interesting to me because, yeah, he, Ben Simmons is an all-star. No question about it. All-star level player deserves to be in the game. But Ben Simmons does none of the stuff that fans want to see in an all-star game. So you don't want to vote for him. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you're not excited to watch Ben Simmons play in the game. You're just not because he's not a, an, an entertaining player to watch. Right? No yeah. one's sick. But he's not. So so there's that piece of it, too. Uh, but I'll pencil Ben in there. I think the Sixers do get two starters in there. So I think Jalen Brown, Jalen Brown's going to be in my wild card spot. And you've got Jason Tatum. So you round it out. you got Jay, you got my, you got Levine, Harden, Jason Tatum, DeMontis Sabonis, Ben Simmons, Jalen Brown. And, yo, Fred Van Vliet deserves love, bro. Like, I just want to see him get in. I just want to see him get in. He's been so good cooking Giannis left and right, man. Taking, you know, like, just being great. He's a great player. And he's and he's transformed his game from day one in the league to now he's so much more comfortable in, in the league. And so I'm, I'm really happy for him. He signed that deal and it looks like he's worth more than it. And that's that's what you want to see. So, uh, yeah, I think that depends on my last wild card spot. I know some people are going to be murmuring for the Colin Sexton's of the world to get in. Wait, hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Stop. I just thought, I just thought, hold on, I just thought. Get Fred out of there. Wow. No, get, no, get the Montes out of there. So bonus is not getting in. Julius Randle's getting in the game. Julius Randle's an all-star. I'm sorry. I, I I had a brain fart. I'm sorry, guys. I don't have my list in front of me. No, I, scratch that. So bonus, get him out of there. I'm so happy you won't get in. Randle is in, and you've got, you got a great squad. you got Fred getting in. I think Sabonis might be Fred out, though. Might is what ha- might happen though. I got Zach Levine, Hart, and Tane, pretty much as everybody else. Tatum, Ben Simmons. I'm throwing Bam in there as one of my front court members. Miami hasn't been playing well together because of injury, COVID, but Bam has been consistent all season. He looks like he's improved from last season. So I'm putting Bam in that mix. Of course, Julius Randle, Jalen Brown gets in for me this year. I said that two weeks ago. Jalen Brown is an all-star on my squad. Bam is the only one I got different from basically y'all. I got Ben Simmons up there, too. I agree. Not the most exciting player, but you got to look at the system, too. You got Embiid there, and you got Tobias Harris. They not a running team. You look at the all-star format, it's running. The point is to be exciting, so I think you can see some excitement out of him, at least passive-wise. Maybe he might excite the fans, pull up from half court just to do it. We'll know, you know. He, we'll he, see. He won't do it. Over in the West, we got starting Steph Curry, Bron Bron, Jokic, Kawhi, and I don't agree with him being a starter, but Luca was one of the starters. He even said it himself. Dame should have been a starter, but that's neither here nor there. Who is in your Western? reserves greg started off well dame dame should have been starting so dame's a lock that's easy i'm um, going cp3 as my second guard in the west uh cp3 deserves it he's flipped the sun situation completely around overhead so he deserves he deserves that consideration and deserves to get in just off the strength of that alone um once you start moving to the front court players it gets real interesting because ad can't play so he he's not going to be in the game so now you have this opening and it opens up a, a position for like a younger up and coming player. So 
you know, we think about the, the three bigs you could have in this game, or, or at least the wing players um, on the outside here. I don't, I don't think a guy like Ingram gets the nod this year, um, and, and I think eventually he will, but not this year. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to. <laughs> the, the West is tough. There's so much talent. I want to go with Book and give him some love and get Book in the game. But do the Suns deserve two All Stars? Is the thing I'm fighting with in my own head, right? When you think about how good the West has been um, overall, it's it, it's tough, man. It's it, it's a it's a tough pick for me. Um, I'm gonna be honest with you. I'm, I'm kind of locked here. I'm gonna be honest. I have a ton of spots to go with for the West, and I and I'm really deliberating here because there's a lot of different ways you can take this um, overall. And I, I, excuse the sounds, but is it, that is that much thought for me that goes into it? I know I've only given y'all two names, which is Damon CB3, but those are the two locks that I have off the top of my head right now for the Western Conference. And so, I mean, hey, look, let's talk this one out. To talk this one out with me, guys, because I want to hear, I want to hear what y'all lists are as well. So I can either be at me disagree with you or be like, all right, it makes sense. Okay. I think one, I think one that we can agree on, I think Miles will be on the same page for this one. One that I will put in the front court, PG 13. Oh, facts. Yeah. yeah. He's been balling out. The problem isn't him balling out in the regular season. It's playoffs. But we got some time before that comes up. But I think he's an all-star. I'd throw Donovan Mitchell in that mix. Yeah, for sure. Lock. Being Ada, number one seed in the West. Nobody expected. I don't care what anybody – I don't think anybody in Utah expected them to be the number one seed at this point in the Western Conference. Top three, top four, maybe, but nobody expected them to be 24 and six at this point. 30 games in, you you couldn't tell me somebody believed that. I'm going to. Miles could disagree, agree. I'm putting Zion in there. That's what I was about to say. I'm like, I don't think it's that hard for him to be an all star this year. He's like, Zion, Zion being an all star game is a, is a favorite to all the fans, but they haven't been that great all year. He's been pretty good. He's been damn good. We've been trying to. That's why I was talking. Because of that. And what about Gobert? You think Utah gets two? They love throwing Gobert in the All Star game. I hate it. I think this might be a hot thing. I think they get three. I wouldn't throw so Conley. I'm not putting Conley in the All Star game. I think Conley's a wild a wild card. I think that I think they're going to give them three. They shouldn't. I think a guy like De'Aaron Fox deserves it. Like he as a wild card. He's a wild card. Because he you put him over Booker. Uh, I mean, I would put Chris Paul over Booker if we're talking about like going yeah. to runs. I think Chris Paul's done more for that team this year than Book's done. <laughs> I don't want to say his whole career, but basically, I mean, they're in the hunt for the playoffs right now. D book hasn't done that really besides the ball last year ever in his career. So that's that just shows the difference between a Chris Paul led team and him not being on your team. He affects women. I, 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 I want but the fans I just, to understand. Bro. Do like Zion. No, Miles, let me cut you off, bro. I want the fans to understand what's happening to Booker, bro. Yeah, I, I, when you start playing winning basketball, things tend to change a little bit. You start, you see these gaudy scoring numbers going down for him. You see halves where he has 20 points in the half and he has two points in the next half. He's struggling trying to figure out how to play winning basketball. And that's the only reason why he's not a lock, but it's because they probably should get two all stars. They have an all star starting back, they have an all star backboard, those two guys. We can, we can all agree. I think those two guys are all stars, but it's, it's, it makes it iffy. And that's why you can put Zion in there, even though they, they haven't been, they've underachieved as a team. Because Booker hasn't been that good. So, no, I just want to take that point. Go ahead, Miles. How bad? No, but with Zion, another reason I like him for the All-Star game is he's kind of turned it up a notch this year. He's playmate. He's he's more of a playmaker this year, too. He's had games, seven assists, eight assists. He's trying to do it all for this team. And even though they probably need more pieces on this team, we even saw it yesterday. They got that fight. They got Lonzo. They got Brandon Ingram, who – He's another sleeper. He probably won't get that love because he's teammates with Zion and everybody loves Zion. So he's going to automatically get that edge. But I just love the way Zion's playing right now. Even though he doesn't have a jumper right now, he's shown that <laughs> he doesn't really need one right now. 
he's still averaging 26, 7, and 3. I mean, yeah. most people would love those numbers, jumper or no jumper. So, so I guess Dame, Dame I should wanna... be in the game. Gobert, I mean, he's the best defensive big in the NBA. I want to nope. ask this question. You brought you brought up Zion being a playmaker. Are the Pelicans best with Zion being the playmaker? You see Stan Van Gunny has been doing that over the last couple of weeks. And when he has the ball in his hands from <laughs> the front court all the way up, it's pretty good. It's pretty successful. Teams have no choice but to collapse on him, double team him, be scared. He's getting over shots with B.I. Lonzo's getting open shots. Is that the best position? And if if the Pelicans are best with having Zion as the playmaker, what does that mean for Lonzo? <laughs> you got nothing. me. You no, got nothing. Me. Nothing. Because Lonzo can shoot the ball. He shoots the ball. He's improved his shooting. So he can play in that style of offense. If you want to ha- have him be a floor spacer and have him hit open threes all night, I mean, he think he's proven he can do that. He's hitting 40%, 47 percent of his three points, right he's in 47 percent now over these last what i think it's 10 is a big sample size 10 to 12 games now so he no nah, man he he can play in that offense the question is do you want to spend for him which if you're the pelicans spending for Lonzo shouldn't be a big discussion because who else are you spending the money on i know bi's deal is coming up if they haven't already paid him and i, I had to double check there um no, but they'll pay zone they'll play zion down the line too but, hey, look, where else are you going to allocate your money to? You might as well pay your young core. And if you let Zoe walk for nothing and you don't trade him, they either have to him or pay him. It's, it's, there's, only, there's only two options. You let him walk for nothing. Some teams are going to be very fortunate to get him because he's only getting better and better every year. Um, so there's that piece of it, too, for me. But, I mean, if, if you're thinking about, like, whether or not they're better as a team when he runs that point guard position coming down the floor, they, they, can, they can be better, I think, in spurts. You don't do that the whole game. You don't do it because I think if, if you're going to do it the whole game, uh, Patrick Beverly is, is going to get up in there and, and press Zion because Zion has big man dribbles, but not like he don't dribble like a guard. Let's not get it. Let's not get it mistaken as smooth as he is. So you can do it in spurts and, and it can be very effective in like a small ball death lineup with him running point guard and spacing the floor out. I mean, we'll see what happens. Uh, it's bring some success so far. I think if. He was in optimum shape. Maybe you could have him do point forward the whole game. And that's the question though, if he's in shape or not, right? that's something that's just going to follow him his whole career. Just his body type. That's just how he's going to have to play. And I don't think that it's a bad thing that he plays at this weight, but maybe down the line, he could stand to lose a few pounds. Yeah. Maybe we'll see like all of them did it. LeBron, Melo, they hit their 14, 15 year. You'll see them on the, the body mag of ESPN next year. Talking about they lost 45 pounds and Melo's wearing tank tops and you can't even recognize him. He got a new haircut. We'll, we'll probably see that for Zion down the road. Maybe he'll join plant based eating in year 15. It's tough. It's tough though down in New Orleans. They got the, that good food down there. So. His weight's going to fluctuate if he doesn't have a cook. With <laughs> hey, with that contract that he's definitely going to be getting coming, that should be the first investment as a chef. Flag on the play segment, y'all know, except for the decline. First one. Michael Pittman Jr. will not give number 11 to Carson Wentz, except for the decline. Except he shouldn't. <laughs> What's Carson Wentz earned in the NFL, bro? To come here and get someone out, up out of their jersey number, yo. Oh, get out of here, yo! Like, see that he didn't win. He didn't win MVP that year. He got hurt. He was he played at a high level. We yo we have an argument, but we're coordinating. Maybe, yeah, fine. We're we're cor- we coordinate these guys way too early. There's there is a statue of Nick Foles outside of the stadium in which he played, okay? Your backup has a statue, not you, bro. And, 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 like, it's not a knock on him. Like, the guy got a chance to play, and he played well. Kudos to him. Who knows? Maybe the Eagles win that Super Bowl if Wentz played the entire way through. Maybe. But 
yeah, for us to act like this guy can come in and take jury to numbers and call shots, you ain't done enough in the league, man. So, no. And Pittman's going to be a stud. Michael Pittman Jr. is going to be a stud wide receiver in the league. I'm mad he's not on the New York football Giants. But let's continue. So, of course, when the situation happens, you know, money is involved. If you are a second-year player, there's no money that could get you to switch the number? Well, that's been his number – Probably since he was a kid, like he was that. Pittman, I see. Yeah, Pittman. So USC was. I think USC might have been. I think he was eleven two there. I think. I think Miles. Nope. Right. Yeah. USC was six? number six. Six. Number six. Okay. All right. I'm mistaken. So then, it's not like he can be number six again. This is his first number. I'm sure he wants to rock out with that. Um, Would you take the bag though? Maybe. Yeah. Depends on how much the bag we're talking. Like, I know Wentz is – that cap hit for Philly is heavy, so he's got money to spend. But maybe Wentz takes number 12. I don't know how Indianapolis would feel about that, but maybe he takes Andrew Luck's old number. I don't Yo, know. They, they better not allow they, – they haven't retired his number yet, but you that's just a respect factor. I know Andrew Luck – didn't play like 15 seasons, but you don't let anybody wear number 12. Not in Indianapolis. When should one nothing to do with number 11 anyways? It, 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 he should have PTSD from a number 11. All right, get out that jersey number. Start fresh. This is a fresh start for you. It's your last chance, buddy. It's your last chance, right? He's, he's over here making this bread. You know, we're going to sit on this money here. You know, I, I can't. I Look, I know we always go here. I cannot help but think like man like what if it was a black quarterback and they were cap tied like that would you get this shot would you have gotten this shot if you were you know what i mean I, I just can't help but think about it the luckiest man alive take a different number wear number one wear number zero start fresh and hope you play good football this year because if you don't there's there's incentives in this deal yeah i think if he doesn't play 70 percent of the snaps this year for them total snaps then that pick that the um eagles get back turned into a first rounder so they're going to be watching that, bro, because they will have no problem pulling him. They'll have no problem pulling him to not give up a first-round pick. He's on a short leash this year, even with being with his old buddy Frank Wright. So, man, start fresh. You reinvent yourself. You work on everything and hope for the best if you're Carson Wentz. Speaking of black athletes and sometimes not getting, you know, the right opportunities, this black athlete continues to get opportunities. Flag on the play. Kima Severn was arrested for street racing in an ice storm in Houston. Before you accept or decline, this is the same player from the Seahawks that was cut for trying to sneak a girl into the hotel during Corona. Accept or decline. I'm going to accept for, for, this, for this fact only. I'm accepting this because of the fact that at this point, you don't deserve to to have a career in the NFL. If you if you continuously you know make childish mistakes like this and act like a child when you have everything you know given you at at, at your fingertips, right? It's every person's dream uh, or every young athlete's dream to play in the NFL or the NBA on that biggest stage, right? And you have had an opportunity in one. Do I get it? No, but at the same time, it's the pandemic. You know, I mean, it's the coronavirus, and and you're at camp, you know, with a bunch of guys around you. But that's just idiotic trying to sneak a girl into your hotel room. But now when it's other lives at risk too, right? And and we're in you're in Houston and, and there's a, a snowstorm, whatever the case may be, an ice storm, and you're still gonna go out there and act childish when you're supposed to be rebranding yourself and rebuilding yourself to give yourself that uh extra shot at getting back into the league. You already have a lot to prove it on your plate and then you go out and do this dumb nonsense. Like at this point, man, you don't even deserve it. Yeah, right now, currently, he's still under – he is under contract with the Raiders, but we'll see how long that lasts with this situation. But it is the Raiders. They tend to like to sign players that have, um, how do you say, tumultuous uh, backgrounds. Just yeah, but talk about, talk about a short leash. We had Vontez Burfick, right? He got out of there. A.B., they tried that. That didn't go the way. You think they're going to do this, like keep someone around that isn't as talented as those, as those two guys? Like, come on now. Yeah, again, as much as we try on this podcast, and I know Greg personally on his own platforms try to push 
equal opportunities for black athletes, black coaches. It's situations like this that it's not the best of a look right now. Speaking of not equal opportunities for black coaches, the Timberwolves fire Ryan Saunders and hire a new coach in Chris Finch in record time, I think. I think this is safe to say in record time. He was hired eight minutes after the T-Wolves fired Ryan Saunders with a David Vanterpool on the bench who has been in the league for 11 years and has played in the league. Accept or decline? Accept, man. This this goes hand in hand with what we said. Oh, I, I said this last last podcast or maybe the one before last, um, just talking about the NBA and how everything they're doing out there is, is performative. And this goes to show you, I mean, like everything with Black Lives Matter, everything with, you know, supporting the players and things, it's, it's all performative. And you made a good point, Antonio, of saying that it's about the owners, not so much about Silver. And you're right. Silver is the lap dog and he's just got to follow the orders. Unfortunately, that's just the way it works. But it, it, it's ridiculous. I, I mean, <laughs> so they had their eye on this coach the entire time. They were working this out. They were going to fire Saunders. We're going to find this out, but I, this had to be what it was. They were going to fire Saunders for weeks now. They've been working this out with that Raptors coach. He was, I believe he was a former G League coach for the Raptors, Finch. Um, they've been, they been eyeing him for a long time, and they were waiting for the perfect moment to fire him. Funny enough, the final straw came against came because he lost to the Knicks. So I think it's funny. It's all yeah. <laughs> He's like, you lost to the Knicks, get up out of here. It's done. But that's hilarious. There's a new Knicks, Miles. Relax. It's a new Knicks. No disrespect. But um, <laughs> but uh, nah, man. Like it's 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 crazy to me. Like you give this guy the job just like that, right? And Vanderbilt was on your bench, who's been in the league, putting in that time, working with great players like CJ McCollum and Dame. Right, being on winning rosters that have won, these guys have won 50 games. He's been on, he's been on that kind of coaching staff, coming from a great coaching tree with uh, Terry Stotts, and he doesn't even get an interview. Right, you gotta be twice as good. You gotta be three times as good. You got chance the same. Right, you gotta be three times as good to get half. And so, um, it, it's it's really sad, but it just goes to the biggest thing I took from this story is the NBA. You know, acting all kumbaya with their black athletes and acting like they support, having this image that they support. They're black athletes is performative. It's performative because at the at the top, there's there's a white power structure in place, and it's nothing is shaking it. Nothing is shaking until Bron owns the basketball team. I think that's why I think Bron's second act is gonna be better than this first act because Bron gonna own a basketball team. And he's gonna shake up the power structure. I think um, when he goes in there and he starts hiring a bunch of black people to run to do to run stuff for an organization. So I'm excited about that. But until then, you know, and that's just gonna be one team. But until then, you know, we're here we are. I think so. And I saw Kendrick Perkins talk on this, and he made a great point, which I think is accurate. When you see situations like this happen, it's more so of who you know. Finch was best friends with Rosas, the person that handled the hiring. We need more people. We talked about this two or three episodes ago. The main solution that we can see as of right now that would only help this, and this is across the board in life, Black people in positions of power, and as Greg said, once you're in that position of power, it is your responsibility to put on qualified Black people in those positions. We don't have that many G, forget ownership. Let's just go even at the Next level, GMs. How many black GMs are there? Barely any, man. Well, we had Dell Demps for a while. We had Minnesota had a black GM for a while, too. Um, Elton Brand. Elton Brand. I James G- Jones. He's a big one. By the way, the NBA is trailblazing with their number of black black GMs. Just think about that. Baseball, you know there's damn well no black GMs, right? I'm, I'm Hockey. <laughs> that's funny. That's That's funny. Um, and, and in football, like, and none. Football, none. none. So if you think about the NBA and what they've done, like, there's more black people sprinkled in in leadership positions, but that's because the sport is dominated by black people to the point where there's no denying them. It's very difficult. And, and when you can, you do. 
And when you can, you do. That's what the NBA does. When you can deny him, you, can, you, you try to. So, you know, it, it is disappointing, but there's a lot of people, there's a lot of tap dancing and performing out there. And I just want people to see through it because the NBA is it's just as guilty as other yeah, sports. Yeah, Vanderpool, Vanderpool doesn't even get an interview. Um, and shout out to him for staying professional because I don't know how I will go to work the next day. The head coach gets fired. Y'all bring in somebody else, and I still got to go back to work. And I'm working with somebody else now. I kudos to him. That's ultimate professional. Last one of flag on the play. Brandon Marshall, friend of the show. Shout out to B Marsh, friend of the show. Said Joel Embiid is not only the MVP, but right now he currently is the best player on the planet, except or decline. Well, isn't that the same guy who wants to fight uh, Deontay you know, Walker? Yes, Hans Bomber. So I, don't, I think he's got a few marbles that aren't right in his head. Mm-hmm. Nigga, he got CTE. <laughs> he got CTE. <laughs> we haven't we haven't diagnosed it yet. He's been on TV saying some dumb stuff for a while now. That was incredibly stupid. I, 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 yo, he, he said that on first thing. Uh, first things first. Yeah. <laughs> Man. I don't even have the energy. Yo, you cannot talk basketball to everybody. And you cannot, you cannot put anybody on a, on a national platform to talk basketball. You, look, you want to say he's the MVP, fine. Like, you can make a case for that. But saying he is the greatest, the best player on earth, Joel B doesn't think he's the best player on earth for real. Give him true serum. You know who he'd say? He doesn't respect. Brown, Brown. You know who he would say? Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Joe and B got well, the cheeseburgers. Yeah, like the, up the court. Looks like the season he's been eating um, beyond meat, so it's cool. It's not regular, <laughs> regular cheeseburgers. Transitioning, this has been a. I want to say it's been probably for our time period, maybe a, a decade long discussion argument whether or not NFL teams can pay running backs top dollar and be successful. And matter of fact, should they even pay them top dollar? So before we get into it, I'm going to throw some numbers out there for our listeners just to give perspective. Top five highest paid NFL running backs in history. Adrian Peterson so far has earned $98 million, no championship. Uh, MVP in 2012. Edgar and James, $68 million. One first team All Pro. Reggie Bush, $63 million. He has a Super Bowl championship, but he was the second running back on that team. Only had 34 yards rushing, I believe, in that Super Bowl. Number four, the anomaly, people would say. Emmitt Smith, three time Super Bowl champion, $61 million. Well deserved. The last good thing that happened for the Cowboys, honestly speaking. Fifth highest paid running back of all time and is still trying to get another check. He might get another check from the Jets. Frank Gore, $59 million he's made in his career. Five-time Pro Bowler, not a champion. The top 10 running backs this season being paid. McCaffrey, we know he don't got a ring. Kamara, no ring. Elliott, no ring. David Johnson, no ring. Dalvin Cook. No ring. Joe Mixon, no ring. Derrick Henry, no ring. Melvin Gordon, no ring. And the person that started this conversation, Saquon Barkley at $7.8 million a year, no ring. Miles, should teams pay their running backs? Or as you say, should this be by committee to try to win a championship? I mean, it's it's been shown that you can win a Super Bowl by committee. They don't, you don't really need a, a top flight running back to win a Super Bowl. Like we, we just watched it. Fournette, Ronald Jones, they weren't number one guys on this team. It was by committee. Even the Chiefs made it by committee. Clyde wasn't the main guy. Le'Veon was there. They have Daryl Williams. So if you look at it, you, you can better allocate funds for your team elsewhere. Like your O-line, that's more important than paying a, a running back because if a running back doesn't have lanes to run through, 
that twelve million dollars they're making a year is burning holes in the owner's pocket. So I see it as because the main reason I brought this up was because I don't think the Giants should pay Saquon what he's gonna want, which I'm sure Greg disagrees, but it's the truth. Like I just don't see it. There's a lot of other holes on that team. Many teams have this problem. Like the Panthers just paid McCaffrey all that money and sixteen million a year. Where has that got them? Besides him winning fantasy championships for people every year, they don't they don't do anything in the playoffs. It's and they're rebuilding now. They're even offering him in a trade for Deshaun Watson because clearly they know you win with a QB, a star QB. You don't win with star running back. So that's all I got to say about it. I want to hear Greg. Greg. Yeah, Greg. No, no, no. no. Let, let, I want to hear CJ real quick, man. Go ahead, bro. Yeah, I think I think Miles' case can be argued to the fact where, yes, yes, I completely agree with you. You're burning holes in the owner's pockets, right? If you have a – a star running back, but but no line. They got nowhere to run. So what are you paying them all this money for, right? But at the same time, like let's look at what happened to. Um, well, this is a whole another topic. We'll talk about Todd Gurley first, right? Todd Gurley. I mean, devil's advocate. He he got paid the bag, right? And then they they shipped him off to, uh, or they not they cut him after not having productive uh, year. And some want to say it's because of his knee injury and whatnot. But at the same time, he hasn't been the same since. Like. 2018, he had the best year, right? Over 1,200 rushing yards, got paid the bag. 2019, horrible year. Not horrible, but for him, it was a bad year. He only 800 and something rushing yards. And then last year, less than 600 rushing yards, and he's still getting paid. And he's getting paid for not putting in the work that, you know what I mean? He's putting in work, but he's not getting paid what he should. Like, he's getting paid the bag. <laughs> Antonio just telling me to stop disrespecting that king. Look, I'm a big fan of Todd Gurley, and I think he's going to have a, a good career, and I think he's going to come back. I just think he's in a really bad situation right now where he's had two bad back-to-back, two bad back-to-back seasons, right? And now he needs a really big season this year to prove that he's worth all that money that the Rams had paid him. If he doesn't, you know, he's going to find himself in, in a bad spot. And and Miles disrespected my man Joe Mixon earlier, but Joe Mixon, he's got some things for us coming this year. I promise you, if he can stay healthy, we're, we're getting him Penny Sewell. We're drafting Penny Sewell at number four this year, and then uh, at number five, actually. And then we got Joe Burrow coming back. That's a whole other topic. That's a whole other topic. We're not going to get into that. But at the same time, I agree with Miles in a way, but I also don't agree with Miles in a way because – one, yes, Todd Gurley got paid the bag. We look at Zeke, too. Zeke had a bad year. He got paid uh, that – he's on that six-year contract tied to, like, 2027. He got the extension, too, had a bad year. Doesn't uh, look himself and, and how he was in years past. And even people can make the argument, too, in years past, yeah, he was a dog. He was, he was getting – he was playing well and whatnot. But at the same time, did he deserve all that money that quickly? Uh, and I think the answer is no. It was too quick. And, and they rush into making these decisions because they're – like we talked about, the players are starting to treat it like it's the NBA, right? They're starting to demand contracts way too soon that they don't deserve and whatnot. Um, but back to Miles's point, Miles was talking about how, you know, Saquon Barkley, you know, his situation right now, do we – do they Giants pay him? I think with someone of, of that level of talent, I think you could build around Saquon Barkley, and here's why. Just what he brings to the game in terms of his athleticism and his – ability to run laterally across the field and uh, vertically in terms of making defenders miss and just keeping the play alive. That's something that's rare. That is a rarity in this league, especially for running backs. You don't see Joe Mixon doing that with any team. You don't see even Todd Gurley when he was back in his 2018 season, he wasn't doing that. He, the system worked for him because they had a great offensive line. He had guards that would pull and lead out in front of him. Saquon Barkley with a bad offensive line, he's doing all this by himself. So I, for him to get his money, I think he should get his money. But I don't. I don't think that. See, it's it's hard to say because it sounds contradictory. You don't want to spend all of your money on Saquon because the Giants do need other pieces. But I do believe Saquon deserves a bag, whether it's with the Giants or with another team. Greg, before you go, people might argue this too. The average shelf life of an NFL running back is three years. And we've seen as not many running backs that actually they might play like a Frank Gore till 67, but 
the production is far <laughs> gone in the past. <laughs> Saquon, contract coming up, coming off an injury. You the GM. You they're gonna use Saquon? They're gonna they're gonna use a fifth year option on Saquon. That 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 is probably what's most likely gonna happen. So they'll push this a year off. Um, first of all, the you can't the, the debate. There's no debate about whether or not you know running backs are are over, can be overvalued, right? You can win without a superstar running back, no question. There's no that's not a debatable topic. You've seen it too much, too many, too many examples. The conversation really boils down to Saquon Barkley. That's what we're talking about. Okay, so with Saquon Barkley. Um, I just think he is he is the closest thing to Barry Sanders I think anyone's ever seen. Even more so, and I, I don't even think the comparison was accurate. Like, there was never a comparison between him and Adrian Peterson, right? But um, he's just that good. And in his rookie year, to get 1,300 all-purpose yards with a terrible offensive line, right? You Can, can you imagine what he's going to do with an offensive line? I will pay Saquon Barkley an exorb- an, a ton of money and the reason why, too, is because of the way the Giants are constructed. If you're looking at – it depends on your team, the way they're built. Like, the Panthers paying McCaffrey was a mistake. Not because – and not at the time. They had Cam. And they thought Cam was going to stay healthy. And they thought Cam was going to – they were going to – they had their franchise quarterback. It didn't work out that way. But if you're the Giants – or, or, like, even the Bengals are a good example. If you're the Bengals, the Giants, and you believe you have you, – you believe internally you have your quarterback of the future – and you drafted him, and you're not paying him that much, you can afford to pay your running back. You can afford to pay luxury positions a lot of money. And on top of that, let's not forget, NFL contacts, contracts are structured in a way where you can get out of them pretty quickly. All right? So, like, you're not cap tied like the NBA. There's not a ton of guaranteed money. You can front load it. You can back load it. There's a lot of ways they can get out of these deals. But, look, Saquon stays healthy, and the old line continues to progress and get better. It's He, he could break 2K. He could break 2 He could be – on some Derrick Henry stuff, but just do it in a different way. Make guys miss in the backfield. He he hits home runs. He hits home runs, and he does it not just running the ball, but catching the ball. So Saquon's value is ridiculously high because of the way he can hurt you. He can hurt you in multiple ways in the field. He's not a great blocking back. I do think they have to they have to tandem. They have to like do a job, do something where they have him work in tandem with other running backs. Um, so bring some other guys in there, and so you can argue right there, like, hey, is that guy worth? X amount of dollars or the biggest, the richest running back contract of all time. The answer is still yes, because he's just that good. He's an offensive weapon. He's an offensive weapon. And if the Giants are using him the right way, you're going to be able to get big explosive plays from out of, out of a jet sweep. You can, you can motion him out and he can, you can line up against a linebacker and beat that linebacker. The Giants haven't even started to really show teams what exactly that guy's capable of doing in the NFL. He was the greatest college running back I've ever seen. Ever. I, I ever seen in my life, like incredible. And when the Giants were picking at that with that second pick, and people were going, Sam Darnold, Sam Darnold, Sam Darnold, take Sam. I'm I'm so happy we didn't. And I was saying at the time, take Saquon. I, I watched Saquon play a couple times, a couple Saturday nights. I stayed at the crib, watch him play, and I was blown away. Like I was blown away. He is he is that good. So no, I think you pay him. Um, you know you can. There's ways to protect yourself as an organization in football. I think we know this against a major injury, he's going to get paid. He's going to have a big year this year, right? Knock on wood, hopefully for him. Um, and, you know, and, and I think it's more about him being healthy. I know his talent. He'll have a good year. So you pay him, but, you know, with, with, the, with the way the Giants are constructed, they're building for the draft. Um, they're kind of supplementing with free agency. The biggest the, – they don't have a lot of money tied up in a lot of guys right now. Leonard Williams about to get a bag. That's it. Where else is the money being spent? Daniel Jones hasn't earned a bag yet. Yet. Have, that'll be a problem to solve in the future. So, you know, like, yeah, man, like you can you can tap the money in Saquon and make sure he's good, knowing you have a rookie quarterback on a really nice deal where you can use the fifth year option, knowing you have, you have flexibility in other places, and knowing the Giants are drafting well. Because you draft well, you can pay Saquon. That's the biggest thing. The only reason why the Giants are in this position is because they drafted well. I know people don't see it if you don't watch the Giants. The Giants have drafted really really well they have a young corner named darnay holmes he didn't get he was the only he was the only cornerback who didn't a rookie cornerback who did, did not give up a single touchdown not one slot corner the hardest cornerback position to learn how to play in the nfl and they got him in the fourth round the is in a good job man like you you can pay saquon 
You can pay luxury positions. They can go pay a wide receiver because they draft well. So, yeah, pay, give them the bag. It's all about team composition. Uh, yeah, I think it's really based off of the team. I think specifically in a giant situation, this is your only weapon y'all have on offense. So this right. is the best decision for y'all to do. Y'all let go of y'all traded Odell. And we know partially what that really was about, but we won't go into that because that's another podcast. Um, mm -hmm. But in general, let's look at the last 10 Super Bowl winners, right? In 09, running back, Steelers, Willie Parker. Would y'all put him in the top 10 running backs that year? Probably not. Oh, 2010, Pierre Thomas. 2011, James Starks. 2012, Ahmad Bradshaw. 2013, Ray Rice. 2014, Marshawn Lynch. 2015, LeGarrette Blunt. C.J. Anderson, LeGarrette Blunt for the next two years, 2017, 2018. Mm. 2019, Sony Michael. 2020, Damian Williams. And this past year, 2021, Leonard Fournette. Oh, I'd have on. to agree with. I'd have to agree with Miles before you go, Greg. I'd have to agree with Miles. You can win. By committee, none of these none of these teams have won with elite, top level, high paid running backs. Outside of maybe you throwing in Marshawn Lynch, but even that game, he only he didn't reach a hundred yards rushing. Um, shoot, Leclerc Blunt is up here three times with two different teams. Hold on, hold on. I, 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 I said this about the draft, and I'll say it again because the draft is super important. I heard this point about wide receivers. I heard, I literally heard them arguing this on NFL Today the other day. They were saying that if you are a GM, do you even pay your top tier wide receiver? That's why these. That's that's why a receiver like Allen Robinson is going to hit the market. When does that ever happen? He could hit the market this year. The fact that we even think he could hit the market is crazy. There, you're getting great wide receivers like Justin Jefferson late in the first round. You're getting. They the Bucks had a wide receiver from Minnesota, Tyler Johnson. They got him in the fourth round. He was a damn good receiver. You were getting really, really good players. And that, the, the point is the talent pool in the, in, the, in the college football is getting better and better and better. And so guess what? I don't have to allocate funds to, to, to premier positions that I used to anymore. So for wide receiver, I can let an Odell Beckham Jr. walk, knowing I might get Justin Jefferson the next year, right? Like, that the, the, the town's getting better. So what I say, I say this to say, I know I'm devaluing the positions even more, but you can allocate your funds differently than you used to. You can spend your money different ways than you used to. The draft, the players coming out of the draft are better. They're just better. So I can pay a Saquon Barkley knowing, okay, cool. Like I paid Saquon Barkley. I need a cornerback number two in the draft. Oh, cool. I got a Patrick Sertain. I got Caleb Farley from Virginia Tech. I got all these guys I can pick from. And that's not even mentioned the sleepers, sleepers in the draft. The, the, the talent pool coming out of college is, is so good that you can allocate funds differently than you could 20 years ago. So this may be a little outdated. And as good as Saquon is, I don't think there's many teams in the NFL that are coming up off of him. Like, I'll be honest with you. I don't. I think I think your favorite team, whoever this is listening to the podcast, is going to pay Saquon Barkley over their running back right now. And Dalvin Cook is a better running back than him right now. But you're projecting what Saquon is going to be because everyone drafted – everyone knew that when he came in, with the, the he had the, the opportunity and he has the ability to be the best running back in the league, hands down. It ain't, it ain't this ain't no Zeke thing, man. Like it's not the same. There's levels to this. I was all expected to be Zeke. He has to change up his style a little bit because he he's a little. He, I don't want to say he's too explosive, but some of his cuts are just not good for those knees. Like he blew out his knee trying to make some crazy move this year. So. I, He's a little injury prone right now. That's the knock on him. He's been banged up the last two seasons. Didn't finish this season. Missed how many weeks last year with a high ankle sprain? He finished with 1,000 yards that year, but it's going to be tough for Gettleman especially, who's – I'll give it to him. He had a better year this past year in making moves. But his track record, <laughs> he's not really going to want to pay these – premium positions like running back, receiver, big money. Oh, no. Hold on now. Yeah. Hold on now. Hold on hold now. Up, hold up, Greg. Before you go, I, 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 just to go off of Miles' point, I think 
I think the reason that you see Saquon doing so much and making all those cuts that you deem unnecessary is because he feels like the weight of the team's success is on his shoulders when he's out there, right? He's the, here's the, he's their guy. Like, they feed him constantly. They put the ball in his hands time after time. They don't have uh, – at least when he was playing early on in the season, the receivers weren't that strong yet. They hadn't come along yet. You know what I'm saying? No he gets, quarterback. He, he, exactly. He's toting that ball, and he, he's getting the ball – you know, throughout the whole entire game, he's just trying to make something happen. Like you can't, you can't blame him for for making cuts when when they don't got a line and anyone blocking for him. He trying, he trying to escape. You know, that's that's always been his his mo is to escape and get downfield. A lot of times it works out for him. But what I also was going to say was he's talking about the control of the team, talking about get it's not get his mo to pay these guys. And I know that there's a list of guys that he didn't pay. None of them were as good as Saquon for starters. And beyond that. Like if you if you're just being real with it, if you if you're locked into Giants, the Giants like I am, like a Giants fan is, that man brought up paying Saquon last year. That man's brought up paying Saquon a bunch of times. The ownership has brought up paying Saquon. They're gonna pay Saquon Barkley. Giants fans know this is inevitable. Any Giants, I know there are Giants fans who agree with Miles who say, "Yo, let him walk." You're idiots. You're not letting him walk. He's too good. He's too good to let him walk. He's too good to let him go. You're not doing that. He's your best offensive weapon you have left on this roster. Like like Antonio said, I don't know about the whole no weapons thing. He's he's a wild and he always throw. He always go over the top. Uh, he always doing too much. But <laughs> no man, that guy is here to stay. He's gonna be a giant for a long time, and and rightfully so. I think he's a very talented player, and and I think with the way this team is constructed, with what they way they built in the draft, the Giants are gonna be in a position to where. And I know you mentioned like not paying top tier wide receivers. They're gonna pay a receiver. They're either gonna pay a receiver or get a really good one with the eleven pick. Like, pick – that's what's going to happen because they've mentioned a million times it's about getting Daniel Jones weapons. So, hey, Antonio can't do what he just did. Throw some shade at, at Daniel Jones talk about they have no quarterback. They, when you give that guy weapons, you gave Josh Allen weapons in Buffalo, you're going to see a different quarterback, and that's what happens. You give him a chance. You, you, Daniel Jones hasn't had a chance. All we've seen him do is play with one arm tied behind his back. And guess what? He's a damn good for a guy playing with one arm behind his back. With no line no speed receiver, no number one receiver, no guy who went, who wins consistently outside of Shepard. That's it. Like, and Shepard's out a lot of time. He gets hurt. Yo, man, I, I, I'm excited because this year is going to be a big year for, for Giants, man. Just, just stay tuned, bro. Stay tuned. And, oh. and, and so after this year, no one's going to be talking about not paying Saquon. It won't be a question. Just watch. So Daniel Houdini, okay, he's a magician, one arm behind his back. <laughs> With that – perspective the only thing i would say before we close this out for before i go our last topic with that perspective which from a financial aspect as an owner as a gm that's smart yes completely agree but those rookie contracts are three to five years that means you're trying to win in that three to five years that's the only thing with that and with gettleman again had a good last year overall as a giants fan i know it's been plenty of times you looked at Gentleman like, yo, what is he doing? Hold this on. year it turned around. So you fired after this year. But he's... yeah, he was on a hot seat because till this season, till y'all players played well, if you be honest as a Giants fan, you may not have had him on the hot seat. But he was on a hot seat and it was hotter than fish grease. So <laughs> yeah, hey, Gentleman yo. drafting, it gives you that three to five window which means he better draft right so y'all have those players for the three or five years on those rookie contracts that's cheaper, and you got to win. That's all Yo, I'm saying. It's a three- to five-year window. The two, the two moves that Giants fans had Dave Gettleman on the hot seat for was Leonard Williams trading for him, when trading for him, not trading Landon Collins when he had the chance. I didn't like the not trading Landon Collins piece, but we don't know what the value was around the league. We just don't know. We, we really don't. I mean – I know the, the Redskins gave him a bag, but we don't know what the Giants would get back in, tra in a trade there. Um, and then also the um, Odell trade, the, the famous Odell trade, right? We know that was motivated by more than just, you know, trading trading him. Like, it was a lot more. It was, I believe it was racially motivated there, too. I, I, don't, I don't run from that. I'm not proud of that as a Giants fan. But both those moves worked out. Trading for Leonard Williams worked out. He's a stud. He's going to get his bag. He, he wow. came here. He blossomed. Huh? You're gonna get a lot of money. You go you relax. You're gonna get his back. You're gonna get paid a fair, you're gonna get it paid at his fair rate. He's in the system that he loves he fair loves rate. the coaches. Huh? What's a fair rate? That's what I want to know. He should touch 
he should touch. I I think he should get. He's gonna want five years. I I I, I think, and he's young enough. Over a hundred. He could that, huh? Over a hundred mil. Mm, nah, chill. You're not getting over a million. Don't don't do that. Don't he's do not that. coming back. He's not coming back then. He is coming back. Yo, look. He's in a system that finally works. And as we know, it's, it is about system based. I mean, when he was the Jets, he wasn't doing these numbers. He's a coach is where it works. He's a brilliant defensive coordinator. Giants get him about 90, 90, 90 mil, 80, 80, 85 to 90 mil. Bring More. him in for like four years. More. No, whatever. No, I don't. I don't how see do you, it. How do you know he don't? How do you know he don't feel like drumming? It feels like he could have a bigger role somewhere else. Where is his role going to be bigger? This doesn't make any sense. <laughs> You could not do more than he did last year. <laughs> no, no, he's gonna come back. He's gonna come back. Um, I think at that number. Um, and, and that the, look, Gettleman's done a really good job. Like, there's just no way around it. Even the moves where you scratch your head on on just initial glance, and that's the Daniel Jones pick too. You scratch your head on initial ga- glance, and you watch him play, and you're like, "There's something here. This t- it's not it's not there yet. It's not there yet. We're, we're not there yet. We need to get him offensive line that can protect him. Have weapons around him." They're going to get some weapons for him. The heard we might look at Curtis Samuel from the Panthers. I'd love to get him. That'd be amazing. Get him some speedy guys around the field that he can throw the ball to. Um, and the, it could, this thing could take off. But get him in. Get him in. There's a lot of credit. Even for the moves that were shaky. I know he's in a hot, hot seat in New York. It's New York. They overreact to everything. Everything's an overreaction. Okay? The guy did a good job. The guy's done a good job. There's no way you can look at this thing, where they are now, versus where they were before, on a, line, or on a team that had no depth. And to be where they are now, nah, man. Uh, he's done a good job, and maybe he doesn't finish the job. Maybe he steps off this thing eventually, and someone else, you know, carries the baton, and they go, they go all the way, and they they become a really, really good team. And he doesn't see it through. But I think he's gonna he's gonna see a lot of this through, and he's done a really good job so far. There's something there. So you talking about like you looking at an ultrasound? There's something there. You think it's going to be a baby, but you find out. It's gas. We'll see if what really comes <laughs> off. Daniel Jones, you're very optimistic. Before we close out the show, real quick, just want to get y'all perspectives. Tell me what y'all takeaways was from the Cam Newton situation. There was a young camper calling him booty and trash, and Cam responded better than most would have. Told him he was rich, but then tried to have a conversation with him and give him some knowledge, but the kid wasn't hearing it. It just came out today. I guess he got home and his pops and his mom probably talked to him. He made a public apology on Twitter to Cam Newton. What was your takeaways from this situation? Man, I try to watch that video as much as I can because there were so many different clips that, you know, these different platforms were were putting up. And I was just trying to piece it all together. Um, But ultimately, you know, it was the same. And my takeaway was this. That kid's a knucklehead. And he knew he knows he's a knucklehead. And I remember being in high school, and that's the first thing I thought of when I was in high school, you know, how I try to show out in front of my teammates, you know, uh, w- whether, you know, every kid does it at some point in their career. He just happened to do it to, to Cam Newton, right? He, he tried to be that guy in, in front of Cam Newton. And um, at the end of the day, like, <laughs> it's so crazy to think about because that's somebody that you should be looking up to as, as an idol, as a mentor, um, someone to help teach you and, and learn from mistakes that he made. You know, this is a, a guy that was a uh, Heisman winner, you know, someone that's played in the Super Bowl, someone that's had a, a great NFL career up to this point. Yeah, he's a free agent. So what? That kid was just stating facts. Yeah, I'm a, you're a free agent. You're a free agent. Like, you're not saying anything. At the end of the day, Cam Newton is rich, and he's here to help you. Like, if – and I just think about so many kids who aren't fortunate enough to be in that situation that that kid was in – being able to play and showcase your talent with your friends. You know, that's the dream. Being able to play in front of a superstar like that who can give you tips and help you get to that next level and you're going to sit here and disrespect him to try to get some clout and to try to make your homies laugh and whatnot. Um, you know, it was it was nonsense. It was, it was silly. And at the end of the day, too, that, that apology, that apology is whack. And it has spelling errors in it. I'm, I wish someone proofread that because at the end of the day, he was missing words. That that and it was it was it was crazy, man. But uh, more moral of the story is that you gotta you gotta respect people that came before you and people that want to help you at the end of the day. Because Cam Newton, that's a connection that you should want to have in your life and in someone that could definitely help you out in the future. But now, 
Cam, Cam knows, like, oh, if I ever see this kid's name again, like, I'm not helping him. Yeah, that was crazy. It was at Cam's event on top of all of this. That, you don't show up to Dr. Dre's studio telling Dr. Dre, yo, the chronic, all, all that was trash, bro. Right. That's, you just don't do that. Miles, you being a father, if uh, Jace pulls something off like this, That's not even going to be an option. Like, you got to have respect for the ones that came before you. That's the main moral of the story is that he's trying to get to where Cam's been. Like, Cam's not out of here. He's not out here on the strength of, like, publicity. He's, ha he's trying to help these kids out. So the fact that he wants to come over here and probably was like, yo, videotape this real quick. Try to get vi go viral, which is... I guess the thing nowadays, you say something disrespectful to somebody famous and then you get, you go viral on Bleacher Report or on ESPN and that's the new thing. But like Cam's, since he's come into the league, he's just trying to help out the young kids in his foundation. He's put many kids in positions to get seen for scholarship offers. So instead of trying to pick his brain, see how he got to where he got to, you turn around and get into an argument with, I mean, one of the better quarterbacks for the last decade. You can't even disrespect him. And, I mean, they named all his accolades, but you shouldn't even have to. Like, it's, it's Cam Newton. You already know who he is. Like, you wouldn't be doing this <laughs> to Dan Orlovsky or <laughs> to anybody else. You're doing it to Cam Newton because it's Cam Newton. Like, you're trying to – gain cloud off of his name and by trying to say oh you're a free agent you're a free agent yeah he's a free agent right now but that means he has teams to pick from still he's not retired he's not out of the league like he has options so saying he's a free agent he has options to go to he had a down year and some of that can be attributed to it's a, a covid year so there wasn't as much training there wasn't as much practice with his team and he was with the Patriots where there was definitely a lack of talent on that offensive side of the ball so you could say all you want Ram Cam who's coming off an injury by the way and nobody really works as hard as Cam I'd say to get back to where he's at so for that kid to just mouth off and disrespect Cam I think Cam handled it as well as anyone could like, Cam's not the type to take disrespect from anybody, but at the same time, he's trying to give knowledge to that kid, too. Like, they were, everybody saw the, the one clip of him saying, like, oh, I'm rich. Oh, you poor, you poor, you broke. But then they, no, nobody saw that other clip until later on where he's, he's trying to reason with the kid, like, yo, like, I'm not, I'm not trying to beef with you. Like, there's no beef here. Like, I'm trying to help you. That's the I main think, I think he's going to have to change his name legally uh, because mm -hmm. for one second, if you think college coach, coaches, scouts, see his name pop up when he sends his tape in, a coach, his high school coach calls, hey, come check out my kid. He's playing this position. Wait, that name sounds familiar. They're going to look it up. Oh, this still on Twitter feed viral. He was going at Cam, and that will. If you wanted to go viral, now you're gonna have to pay the consequences, and I think this will follow him for the rest of his young career, unfortunately. And he better be—I don't know what position he's playing, but he better be darn good to make sure that this isn't going to be a factor in whether or not a college wants them to come play because they don't want no distraction. You know, yeah. no college wants to deal with that. Greg, G baby, the, the, the scout on the show that deals with a bunch of these little kids and the younger kids. And I know you've seen a couple of your knuckleheads and your time and a couple of baby's kids. What was your takeaway from this? It, it's a, it's a generational thing. It, it's, it's a generational thing. A lot of these kids just don't respect what who paved the way for him what came before him this is a lack of general respect of this generation for sure and i don't even mean that like from a sports perspective i mean that and like a life perspective life. 
these kids are wilding out, wilding out, bro. They do whatever they want, bro. I saw a headline, a bunch of coach, a bunch of kids beat up their high school coach after a game. Like that really happened in Newark. Um, no, I, I don't know if y'all Shabazz. Shabazz beat up their high their high school coach. Like, what? Like they're wilding out. It's crazy. It's a it's a generational difference with the way that they approach adults. Forget celebrities, adults. And that's why something like this can happen. Um, so the kid is obviously an okay head. He's obviously a kid, you know, and 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 I and once I got over the initial disrespect of it all, where I'm just like, yo, like I was mad. Like I was like, Are you talking to Cam like that? Like Cam doesn't have to be there. <laughs> Cam the Cam goes to this camp to give back to the kids. Cam's a good dude. That's what he is. And he gives back to these kids and he, he puts more into his camp. His camps are more of a of a thing, of a of an exciting thing to do and exciting thing to be at because you know you're gonna see him there. You know he's gonna bring, he's gonna give back. He's gonna give his own time to this thing and invest in you guys. So yeah, I mean the kid doesn't have the the foresight to see it. Um I think it is more a knock more of a knock on the parents than it is on him. I don't think it's a knock on him. I think it's I think it's a knock more on the parents because even if the and I, we don't know him, but listen, man, like I'll tell you one thing my kid's not going to do. And that's not, I'm not having no kids anytime soon. But that when I when I do have kids, like one thing they're not going to do is come left at like an authority figure. Like you're not, you're not doing that. That's just not, we're not playing that game. So, and, and that's, that's, that's aside from the fact that Cam's a hall of fame football player and the kid was just being idiotic. But I hope this doesn't follow that kid. I hope that kid gets a break because I, I, you know, he's young, he's young, and I, and, and he made a mistake, and it shouldn't, it shouldn't ruin his life, okay? The kid couldn't put together a full sentence in that damn apology he wrote, all right? Like, it, it, we need to, you need to give that kid a chance. And I think the cool thing about, about Cam is that, Cam, I think Cam would help that kid out if he saw him down the road, because I think Cam's that kind of dude. I, I really, I really do. I really do. So, Cam, shout out to him to be the bigger person, because you easily get to boot him up to Cam. You easily could have booted that kid out the camp. Easy. No, no questions asked. Could have been gone. He wasn't. He stayed. He played. He got he got the full experience. And he didn't pay for that. And so I hope that I think that's a really it's a much bigger thing. Like I, I man, don't don't let's not let's not crucify this young black man out here on the on the TVs. I'm glad they didn't put his name out on first take. I'm glad they didn't put his name out there. Let him learn from his mistakes because we've seen, and I know I bring it back to race, but we've seen this the other way. I have seen kids that are not black get away with this kind of stuff. I have seen it. We've all seen it. And so I just want to get, make sure that kid gets a chance to grow from his mistakes. Cause it's, it's kids make kids do dumb stuff. That's just, you know, that's the reality of it, but it is a generational thing. That is some wild stuff. These kids are wild. These kids are really wild. And, and they be trying kids be trying me every day. And they don't think that I'm not cam. I will not, I'm not going to handle like, I'm not, getting rich. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not rich. I'm not rich. <laughs> Or I will bust your ass. Like, I'm not Cam. <laughs> I'm not. Man, that's a wrap. It's another episode, another installment of the Bench Mob podcast. As we just heard Greg say, uh, Miles has a child. Greg's is next. Chris is next. And I'll be last one. You I'll already be know. Last on the list. Chris, you next. In June 2020, we out here. 2021. <laughs> right. I see you. Greg is on the way with his, but y'all know the vibes. Uh, speaking of kids, y'all know the vibes. If you stay ready, you don't got to get ready. Bench mob, we out. Peace. Peace, you coming soon. <laughs>